rolling sound, but here we go. One point six seven. And starting right around. Hi, Chad Matthews with the Lone Star Film Festival here in Fort Worth. Thank you so much for checking out this film talk. We've got writer and director John Carter, who's bringing his documentary feature film, The Cowboy Hat Movie, to this year's festival. Make sure to check it out through the Lone Star Film Festival's website. Uh, it will screen through Sunday, so it's definitely a movie to check out. So, John, thank you so much for being with us, and welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Chad. I'm, from, I'm so happy to be here, obviously. Uh, I wish I could be at the festival, you know, and and every festival that's going on that we're missing in these these uh, uh, sort of somewhat depressing times for film lovers. But uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's an honor to be here. It would be so much fun to do this in front of a live audience, especially in a, a hat happy town like uh, Fort Worth. So how perfect would that be? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'd wear mine, and everybody could wear theirs, and we could compare, and yeah, it'd be perfect. Speaking of which, I felt like I, I was going to be dressed inappropriately if I didn't uh, don a cowboy hat to, um, you know, have oh, this film talk with you. What a look. silver bell of beauty. I love that you've got kind of a quasi taco brim. Uh, it's a classic, classic cowboy hat and so appropriate for Fort Worth and Cowtown. So, yeah, uh, nice, nice job. I like it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm doing a shoot actually in LA, a very controlled kind of, you know, COVID level shoot and it's indoors. Uh, so I don't, I don't have my hat handy. So I, I, I apologize for not having my hat. Is that where you're uh, coming to us from is from LA or. Yeah, I'm actually in Burbank. Uh, we're filming a little project out here for, uh, for a few days and, and getting back in the saddle a little bit and, and in a meaningful way with a decent sized production. And, uh, yeah, we're we're sort of slowly getting back into production on on some other work. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, it's it's interesting and both challenging and fun at the same time. Obviously, there's a lot of issues with with COVID and safety and how we do things, and that's that's a bit of a challenge. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's starting to crank back up again a little bit. Very cool. Well, let's talk about that real quick. Your your background as a, as a filmmaker. I mean, you've had a a, a long career and and you've you've worked in advertising and sports broadcasting. Um, how did that really hone your skill as a filmmaker and a storyteller? Yeah. So um, interestingly enough, I spent a, probably uh, a little over a decade, actually probably about 13 years off and on in Dallas, Fort Worth. And I did a lot of advertising in those days, which is also where I got my broadcast uh, career started. And interestingly enough, actually the first uh, sports television show I did was the tour of texas which is a bike race a pretty sizable stage race bike race that uh, that took place all across the state of texas and actually started uh, in in dallas and and went all through the criterium in fort worth so uh yeah it's uh, texas is uh, was my first home uh out of mississippi where i grew up and so uh, that's where i got my career started after after doing a little bit of film school stuff so i came back to dallas and worked in advertising and simultaneously i started doing Sports television work, uh, which culminated in, in a career in, in television uh, up until about 10 years ago. Um, and yeah, I've done a little bit of everything. I've done three Olympics and a lot of sports television, but I also did a lot of advertising and, and some of the old old advertisers in town, Richards Group, and and some of those companies are very, very familiar uh, to me. And and that's what really got my career started. And so to get get to the core of your question, which is how did, how did it sort of set the table for what I'm doing now? Um, it, it was very instrumental and in, informative in, in, in getting my career going and really give me a great technical base uh, to work off. In, in those advertising shoots, I was actually a director cameraman for a number of years. And so I shot commercials myself as well as directing them. So obviously I immersed myself into the, into the film world at that time, shooting a lot of 35 millimeter film with big budgets and big crews. Uh, because that's what advertising want. You know, advertising wants that that Hollywood look and and those technical abilities to do everything that looks, uh, you know, more than professional and slick and everything else. So both camera work and then editing techniques and things like that all sort of emerge from that advertising background. Uh, and then, like I said, in those days, we were shooting film, so you really had to be uh, um, really technically on your game. Otherwise, you could uh, you could waste a lot of money uh, and and a lot of 
blow a lot of film, uh, which was expensive and still is expensive, uh, but uh, a little bit less pressure on us today with digital media and, and things being being digital based. So that that kind of gave me a good basis uh, in terms of my career, starting uh, with a, a great, great, you know, uh, uh, base level knowledge of camera work, shooting the camera myself, utilizing camera, lens selection, film stocks, all, all those things that are technical choices that go into going to a production. And luckily, advertising kind of gave me that really, really good, really good, solid education um, that that really sort of continues today. I utilize utilize all that knowledge uh, I, up until about midnight last night. So I still use all that stuff uh, uh, on a daily basis. And then the sports stuff, um, I really just had a passion for storytelling and the sports stuff and the Olympics and, and some of the things I've done in sports television um, were very formative in a different kind of way in terms of that I was having to tell short form stories, but narrative stories that people could grasp and 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 get engaged with in a short short amount of time. So I've got a lot of experience telling what we would and say in the filmmaking world are short form stories, but there were feature feature stories, personality driven stories, um, you know, geography, uh, athletes, things like that. Uh, my big big sort of uh, a big chunk of my career was was done doing the was engaged doing the Tour de France. Uh, for six years, I think, uh, during the Lance Armstrong years. And so obviously at the peak of the interest of the Tour de France, uh, I'd, I'd done a lot of cycling in the Olympics and things like that. But I spent uh, I spent a big chunk of my career and and actually was was responsible uh, on the technical side for bringing the Tour de France uh, live to the U.S. for the first time. It had been a tape delay show and a tape highlight show for a number of years before we actually started broadcasting it live. Um, in 2001. So um, that's that's kind of my my uh, story and all of that stuff sort of provided a really good base. Uh, and then for the last few years, I've sort of transitioned more into the entertainment side than, than the sports side. It, it sounds like um, we could have a complete conversation just about, you know, your career before this movie. So uh, awesome. It's, it's really fascinating. Very, for sure, Chad, yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about um, the Cowboy Hat movie. So You've mentioned that um, the, the idea of the movie was birthed after you um, did a TV segment about a hat maker in Montana. Right. What from that experience really just stuck with you that you were just like, I have to make a movie about cowboy hats? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, just something about that story. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So there, there's a gentleman um, up in uh, uh, Billings, Montana, um, Rich Rand, that's been making hats since the 1970s. He, he started very young and he's continu he continues to do it to this day. And he's still got a hat shop in, in Billings, but he also travels and, and does shows, but also does a lot of custom hatters for a lot of a lot of high end, a lot of high end customers all across the country. And he's done movies and television shows and everything else. But I went to his shop. Uh, we used to do a, a, a little television show. Uh, called Cowboys and it's sort of about Western lifestyle and, and and involved shooting sports and Western wear and just everything that that was related to the cowboy, the cowboy lifestyle. I ended up in this little shop in Billings and meet this guy named Rich Rand. And Rich is just making hats one at a time uh, in the old way, in a way that John B. Stetson would, would easily recognize uh, from from a process standpoint, the, the, the craft of making and shaping hats. And customize them. It hasn't really changed since since hats have been invented, more or less, and since Stetson kind of codified that kind of technique in terms of how how you make a cowboy hat. So Rich is still up there doing it since the 1970s, and just the level of craftsmanship and passion and um, variety, all, all those different things. But more or less, one of the things that really struck me uh, as, as really interesting was the fact that. Rich talked about when you put on a cow, when he selected a cowboy hat for you uh, and, and he could do it within two or three hats. He said, I'll pick two or three hats. And, and part of this is in the film. So I can pick two or three hats. Uh, and within that second or third hat, I'll put it on your head and it will transform you. And it's true. Uh, and and I think we just saw that with you, Chad. When you put your hat on, you became a different you became a different personality. It it changes you. You sit a little taller. You sit a little prouder. Uh, uh, and and it transforms you in, into something that I think is iconic and, and recognizable. You know, the ideal of the cowboy um, is really represented through the cowboy hat. And I think the, uh, the, the impetus for the story 
sort of stuck with me for multiple years. I think it was probably five or six years. And I talked about it for a couple of years. Like, you know, it's a singular idea. It's not controversial. It's not, uh, it's not edgy, you know, in any way, really. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a very simple kind of subject matter and it's light uh, um, just by virtue of that subject matter, but it's so interesting. And I just kind of, I kind of wanted to explore the idea, you know, of, of how something becomes iconic uh, over the course of 100, 150 years and, and just sort of becomes indelibly kind of imprinted on, on, on our psyche as, as an American icon. I mean, as a true artist, you just have that inside of you and you just you have to get it out. Right. You just this is a story you had to tell, even if it wasn't edgy or something that was going to be commercial. You just you had to do this story. Um, you know, what I really love about the film is that it was it, it seems so well researched, like you must have put a ton of work into uh, yeah. putting it together. Um, I want to talk about how that process begins. I mean, we. Evidently in the movie, you know, there was a ton of research, but what was the moment that you're like, we're going into quote unquote production? Was it, we're starting to do interviews, we're doing B-roll, uh, we've been funded. I mean, when were you like, I'm actually shooting this, I'm not just thinking about it or, you know, writing about it right now? Right, well, step-by-step um, -step process, I did actually write an outline first. Uh, because one thing I think, and it's by virtue of the fact that I've done a lot of television and a lot of structured, Storytelling is the fact that that's my process uh, to a certain degree where I need to kind of need to have a little bit of a roadmap to, to sort of start the process. And part of the outlining process is to really validate the idea. Can can you tell a narrative story over a very traditional kind of narrative three arcs kind of structure about the cowboy hat? And so we start sort of diving into those aspects. OK, how do we begin the story? How do we sort of sustain it in the middle? And how we how do we tell a complete story that has a that has a meaningful ending? Uh, it's not just pretty picture after pretty picture. It sort of tells an area of art with peaks and valleys. And we've got life, death, invention, birth, you know, everything else that that sort of is represented in narrative film. We've got we we think we've got it in the film and uh, and hopefully the audience can, can recognize that. So, again, process wise, you outline it and then you start writing. And, and uh, it didn't take a ton of time to write, to be honest with you, uh, because once you've got an outline in place then you can start sort of filling those blanks. And then you start changing everything because what happens is you've got some suppositions in your in your head and in your script that just aren't true. And then we start talking to people and do a little bit more research. You find out, oh, that was that was either urban, you know, kind of an urban legend aspect of, of, of the history of the cowboy hat or it's just flat out not true. It's a supposition you have. So you kind of refine those things. You throw out scenes and ideas and then you start filming. So we actually started filming a little over two years ago. And the, the trigger for that was just the desire to do it. Uh, we self-funded the film. Uh, we, we're lucky enough, I'm lucky enough, and our company's lucky enough uh, to kind of have resources. Uh, and then we would sort of tag it on to another production. So we shoot a show called Hollywood Weapons uh, in LA uh, a lot, which is about movie effects and can you really do what they do in, in Hollywood with explosions and weapons and, and things like that. So. Uh, we had a production and still have an ongoing production based in Los Angeles. And so that kind of triggered us to go, OK, we know Hollywood is going to be a huge part of this because really, you know, the cowboy and, you know, sort of adapted and, and used the cowboy hat and sort of be, made it, I, you know, made it what it was from a utilitarian standpoint. But Hollywood is obviously what sort of solidified it in terms of that iconic nature and what it sort of symbolizes. So we knew we wanted to spend a fair amount of time in Hollywood, both researching and filming. And so some of the shots you see in the film shot in front of the Hollywood sign uh, and across the um, across Grauman's Chinese Theater and, and the Hollywood Walk of Fame and some of that stuff. We just knocked out while we were in L.A. shooting some other stuff. And so you sort of start just tipping off those little those little boxes of what you do. And then some of that starts to change, you know, um, I, one slightly boring. But a, 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 I think the filmmakers might be interested is that we were I was really dead set. There, there's a museum out here called the Gene Autry Museum. And they've got this repository of cowboy hats and wardrobe uh, that are not only from Hollywood and from Gene Autry's collection. And then the fact that because Gene Autry was a television star and a cowboy, you know, everybody gives him everything. So they've got the Lone Ranger, you know, costume. They've got everything from television to film uh, in their repository. But they were undergoing a massive um, 
reconstruction of all of their storage facilities and even the museum to a certain degree. And they said, basically, we're going to be shut down for a year and a half at least. And it's turned, it's now turned into, I think, something like two and a half years in terms of letting researchers and people like us come in and film. So that has to go away. You have to take that whole aspect of what you wanted to do in terms of filming and some of the part of their collection that I wanted to tell some stories about and just say, it's simply not possible. They will not let us in. They won't let anybody in. So then you, you, re, you revise and, and we end up at places like the Tom Mix Museum in Dewey, Oklahoma instead. And it turns out to be the richest, you know, repository of, of the greatest. I mean, Tom Mix is the man when it comes to cowboy hats and sort of probably has done anything or more than anyone else uh, to, to build, build the reputation of the cowboy hat by virtue of the fact that he had this just massive white, you know, crazy hat that's still to this day when you walk into a, a Western store or a hat store, you can say, I want a Tom Mix and they'll fix it up for you just like, just like the one he wore. So. <laughs> that's, that's excellent. I love uh, hearing how you, you approach the process through writing first. I think a lot of filmmakers make that mistake of like, well, let's just shoot it and we're going to find something and boy, you can go down, uh, you know, a bad rabbit hole with that. So um, really yeah. great advice uh, for I, filmmakers. I just heard that. Yeah, that's that's not a good pro. I, I've tried it. it. It doesn't work that well. So I disagree with that. Have so, a plan. Yeah, yeah, have a plan. Yes, without a doubt. Um, so I, I kind of want to talk about because uh, we get a, these questions a lot from aspiring filmmakers that are wanting to do documentaries. Um, you know, they're talking about release forms and rights to music and television and um, film. How much of a bear of a process is? the business side of making a documentary like this movie uh and did you have to hire like an entertainment lawyer immediately i mean it just when i watched it i thought well, how did they get all this footage you know how did how did you acquire all this incredible content because it had to have been either outrageously expensive or someone had to do a lot of work <laughs> a little bit of both actually uh, a lot a lot of the second um doing a lot of work is really is really the the key there uh, I'll, I'll talk about process a little bit in that same point. It's obviously a historical, uh, a historically based film, so you're you're completely reliant unless you just want a boring talking head talking the whole film, which is something obviously you don't really want, uh, and and that's that's kind of usually a key sign that that something was not or somebody was not available uh, in terms of getting resources in terms of archival footage, and we use a lot of still photography and a lot of artwork and a lot of different things because we go back as far as the early Vaqueros, you know, from the 1600s and, and, and onwards. So we're, we're reaching that far back and then obviously we're going through the, the Hollywood archives. So um, that outline, that script really sort of set the table for that. And what you start doing again is taking off things that sort of apply to what you've written on the page and then you start acquiring it. And so in practical terms, yes, lawyer is almost number one in this process in terms of getting everything buttoned up. And I'm lucky to have some resources in that standpoint. And so this is a this is a very meaningful shout out to Colleen and Michael, uh, who, who were kind of my my legal team and and helped tremendously for us. But more importantly, uh, we have uh, I have a staff and, and the producer on this film, Olivia Olson. Uh, really dug in and, and also uh, our associate producer, Eric Knudsen, in our office. Those guys probably spent the better part, I want to say probably close to eight months uh, clearing rights for stuff that I wanted. So you go into an archive, either at the Smithsonian or at the, uh, the Library of Congress, per se, or even uh, Autry has like, you know, digital and, and printed resources are available electronically. So you've got all these all these sources, but you have to clear those clear those rights. And so not only you do that, then you end up with on the high end of the spectrum, you end up having to go to uh, the John Wayne Foundation and, and clearing his likeness. And obviously, John Wayne's likeness is a very controlled, uh, valuable asset uh, to the Wayne Foundation. And his, his son runs that. But they have a very you know um, streamlined process. And so it's just cumbersome from the standpoint that you have to do a lot of legal paperwork, and things like that. So. When you embark on this kind of a film, it, it really isn't coming on you to really sort of uh, cross your T's and not your eyes. And to be honest with you, the, the one of the most cumbersome aspects of it is music, and especially in a show like this where the music's so important. And so just as equally important, we probably spent almost a better part of a year working on music rights and clearances and, and getting everything that we wanted. And again, it's a compromise. There, there's 
I'm still heartbroken. There's probably about three or four tracks that are really, really, really wanted uh, that we just couldn't clear uh, feasibly. And some of that was down to just logistics. A lot of these tracks, I was using old, old, old Western swing tunes and things like that. And they'd be out there. There's, and it's going to segue into something that I think I know you want to talk about is that we end up sort of diving into this world of Western music that's sort of now a subtext for the cowboy hat and, and a subtext for the whole film. And then you meet people like you, you get introduced to people that I knew about, like um, like uh, Art Greenshaw, uh, who is now kind of keeping you know Western swing alive, and he's he's based in your neck of the woods uh, uh, over on the Dallas side of, of, of Dallas Fort Worth, but you know he's keeping that Western swing. So you know we go back as far as Bob Wills and 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 all of those things that sort of became you know a part of getting introduced in a deeper way to like for us Doughboys, which were uh, a Fort Worth band and the, the originators of uh, Western Swing with Bob Wills and Milton Brown. And so not only do you sort of go through this process with the cowboy hat, now now I'm up to my neck in Western you know music that I think is appropriate to it in a great, great way. And that's one of the that's one of the joys of doing a project like this. You you get you get turned on and, and, and introduced to so many different elements that can elevate and enhance. And, and it's easy to give up in the process because, oh, that image is not available or it's not available in, uh, easily. But it's also the same with music. You, you start tracking down a publisher and Eric and Olivia really spent months just trying to find out who owned the publishing rights and the, and the sync rights to a track that I wanted um, in the film. And, and that just sort of becomes this this sort of quagmire of, of labor and effort, and you really have to have a lot of lot of resources in that standpoint. So uh, don't if you're going to do a, a historical film that you need historical images, and you want to add original, uh, not only original music, which we have a mix of original music and and a lot of classic classic songs. Um, it, it's a lot of labor, but I think it adds a adds an element to the film that's just it's not replaceable. So I wouldn't want to do it any other way. Uh, and luckily, I have people that want to work hard for me. So, you know. Well, it's great. You got you did a wonderful job of the layers. I, I love that it, it starts from a simple idea of like talking about a hat, but then it goes into the cowboys, into Hollywood, into music. Um, so that's what makes it really rich and fun. And and I'm going to tell everyone, you know, that that, that we have a, the opportunity to talk about this film to to go check it out. It's it's pretty fun. Um, Good. You you. Well, I'm, this is going to be pretty specific, and someone that has to watch the movie to kind of understand this. But in the end of the film, you have um, the credits where you're you're showcasing, I think, thirteen hats, and yeah. it, they're almost like characters. But in the movie, you you shoot these close up shots where the hat is rotating, and I thought, well, they're all in, it's just in a studio. And then I thought, well, no, he's going to these places and doing it. How did you make it look like it was in one place at one time? Like it it was seamless. And then how did you make the hat move like that? Yeah, so uh, advertising again, sort of uh, it, anybody that's ever done a food shoot or, 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 or say a jewelry shoot or anything like that, you, you use what we call a turntable and it's just a motor, a mechanized kind of motor and you can put things on it. You could spin a plate or you can you know, spin a diamond ring or whatever it is. And so I was kind of familiar with that idea and, and really one of the first sort of epiphanies I had in terms of laying it out and sort of came from the outlining process was the fact that the real stars of the film were actually going to be the cowboy hats themselves. And so we're going to feature those hats in a visual way that entices the viewer to really get engaged with it. And some of that was inspired by, by Rich. You know, he, he did a book uh, 20 or 30 years ago that really had some beautiful photographs in it. And I said, I want the film, I want the film to really uh, uh, have that kind of element to it where the cat, the hats themselves are the stars. And, and we shoot them in a, in a really, really beautiful way. So we took our little turntable set up. Uh, and, and again, we, we would go into a place. And, and to answer, you know, the beginning of your question, I think you were alluding to it, the fact that we actually shot Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president of the United States. We actually shot his real cowboy hat. We shot Tom Mix's, his actual cowboy hat. And so you go to these museums, we shot the Cody Museum, we shot the LBJ Presidential Library and the, the Presidential Ranch. We shot at uh, um, the Tom Mix Museum, like I said before, we shot all over the country to find all these different hats. And, and so these things are historical artifacts that are more or less priceless. You know, we've got Buffalo Bill Cody's uh, last cowboy hat that he wore as part of the Wild West show. Uh, and, and so 
we move into a space and we did it all across the country. Um, and, and, and we basically sort of did a lighting, a, a very sort of small lighting setup. We use a different background for every for every hat so that everything has its own unique personality. We kind of match the background to the hat. Uh, we think visually so so everything's tied. Um, and then we kind of culminate in, in sort of a, I won't I won't spoil anything, but we kind of culminate in what we think is sort of representative of, of the hat of the hat of hats, which is the whole film is more or less a journey to kind of find out is is there. Is there one hat that kind of is, is, is the hat of hats, the best hat of all? And I think we kind of answered that. Um, and, and so these things are valuable and people don't necessarily want you to do anything to them. So we, we go in with kid gloves and, and literally white gloves like museum curators. And we, you know, we take them out of their repositories and resting places. We put them on this little turntable. And museum curators all over the country are sweating. You know, it's like, don't drop the hat. You know, don't get anything on it and things like that. And 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 we managed to pull it off. And and despite the 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 disappointment we talked about in terms of not getting into the Autry Museum, we ended up with really the the list that I wanted. Uh, and and I think we we gave them the honor that they deserve. And you know, built our little backdrop. Uh, and and we did it all within about fifteen or twenty feet in museums and and. And um, and and little locations all across the country to get that lineup. And and like you said, when the credits roll, uh, you can see where all those hats came from, and it's a pretty diverse list. See, see, just talking about hats, you know, it makes me inspired to to put my hat I, back I'm, on. I'm um, disappointed. I can't, I can't join. I really am. I do. I do travel and 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 wear my hat a lot now. And a lot of it's because it's it's a very practical. It's a very practical utilitarian um, tool still to this day. Uh, it's just, you know, I, uh, I ended up on an indoor shoot and I'm sorry I can't join you, Chad. You, you, look, you look great though. If, if uh, you're on the fence about whether or not you need to have a hat in your life, watch this movie and you're gonna be sold on it. You're gonna be like, I've got to go out there and buy a hat immediately. Everybody needs a cowboy hat. There's no doubt about it. So John, what's your ultimate goal with this film? Where do you hope it goes? Do you have distribution planned out or um, where can we see it after the festival? Yeah, we're, we're just finalizing uh, distribution uh, and, and sort of getting uh, everything in place. But uh, yeah, it's gonna be available uh, widely. We just, you know, we've, we just finished the film a couple of months ago and are getting out to festivals. We wanted to kind of get out in the festival world first while we explored some distribution options. But it's going to be available, you know, through all traditional means of distribution. Hopefully, in the next couple of months. So I can't give you anything in terms of hard specifics, but we think we've got something finalized, and we'll start getting uh, widespread distribution. And it should be available both on DVD, all the streaming service, all the mainstream streaming services, and things like that uh, within within the next couple of months. So uh, that legal team that was uh, tied down doing clearances and and uh, and and all of that stuff that went along with the film now are are catching their breath and actually going through a distribution contract right now, but we're, we're, we're pretty solidified and, and we're going to, we're going to get out to the world uh, in the commercial way. So everybody should be able to see it, but obviously we encourage everybody to, to hit, to hit the festival circuit, but hit, hit you guys. I mean, obviously you're watching this Lone Star. It's got the film up for a few days virtually. And thank you guys for doing that. These virtual festivals are, are, you know, sort of throwing a lifeline to us film lovers and giving us something something to do while while we're uh, while we're figuring out what we're going to do. Uh, so we appreciate what you guys do, and 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 your mission is 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 special and critical for for what we do. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. We really do appreciate your time, uh, John Carter, folks, the writer director of the Cowboy Hat movie, which again could be screened online through the Lone Star Film Festival through Sunday. So uh, thanks again, John. I'm Chad Matthews, and uh, thanks for watching. Hey, my hat to you, Chad. Thanks very much. <laughs> Born out of necessity and self-preservation in the wake of manifest destiny, and cemented as a symbol of manhood on the silver screen in Hollywood's heyday, the cowboy hat is perhaps the pinnacle of virile self-expression good cowboy hat that's worn daily and that's worked in is kind of like scars on a body. It's not the prettiest thing, but it tells a story. What is it about this boldest of fashion statements? Unavoidably big, 
unavoidably prominent that fascinates. The cowboy's hat was their personality, their personal pride and joy. If they're wearing the right hat, they can project America. And what is the purest ideal hat out of the thousands and thousands of handcrafted lids? What is the hat of hats? The Western hat, the cowboy hat, the buckaroo hat, the hat is a style. It's pretty much in the DNA of America. Is the cowboy hat as an icon even still alive? Or did it die with the Western, John Wayne, and the demolition of the original Stetson factory? Or is the cowboy hat bigger, better than ever? Well, follow me, because that's what I aim to find out. <laughs>